Hey everyone, and welcome to the Jumnashad Conference. I'm delighted to have Joe Campbell with us today. Joe is what is probably best described as a mensch. I follow him on, on Twitter and Facebook, in addition to having been a friend of his for uh, for many years now. And what I see from, from Joe's output is an almost constant stream of helping people, making suggestions, saying, have you thought about this? Could you do better? And I think that's what you'll find when you listen to Joe today, that he has a a real desire to to reach out and push other people forward to make them better, to give them ideas, to give them encouragement. And so, Joe, I'm delighted to have you with us. Welcome. Thank you, Steve. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, as you said, I, I do like to help people. Uh, in fact, it's kind of like a personal mantra of mine, uh, help those who help others. Uh, literally, it's like a personal mantra that I live by. And uh, I wouldn't be where I am if it wasn't for other people helping me. So I'm kind of like just paying it forward. And uh, as you said, today's presentation will basically uh, talk about some things that I've learned over the years, some things that I believe. And I can't say that, you know, this is the gospel. It's just things that I find to be useful, uh, make my life a lot easier when it comes to publishing. And hopefully you can um, receive some type of benefit from it. So without further, further ado, uh, we're going to talk about publishing principles. So let's start off by actually defining what publishing is. Um, I, th I think everyone knows how to pronounce it, so I won't, I won't read that part, um, but I will talk about the definition, and that is to produce and disseminate information, resources, and ideas to the public or specific audiences. So um, when I read this definition, and just so you know, this is kind of like an amalgamation of uh, the traditional definition and some, you know, some points that I put in there as well. But to me, what I really, what resonates to me when it comes to publishing is, it's a selfless act. It's really not about you. It's about your audience, serving them quality content that they want to consume constantly and that they want to share with others. So the, some of the, the points that I'm going to discuss is going to hopefully help you do that. So at the beginning of any good concept, right? Any good piece of content is, is a concept. And that's the quote. Good concepts are the seeds of good content. And um, I think we see that across every medium. I mean, we're going to talk more about web uh, and web production and, and, and websites and pages and blog posts today. But let's be real. It's, it's evident in everything from it could be a restaurant, it could be a movie. It all starts with an idea. So let's talk about that concept. And to be honest, the, the first thing we need to think about is concepts come and go. So what do we need to do? We need to record our concepts. And there are many different ways to do it. Um, I'm not going to say what's best. I'm going to talk about some of the methods that I have used over the years. Um, but I would definitely say no matter what method you use for recording your concept, it should possibly, if not definitely, follow all three of these criterias. And that is one, it should be cloud-based. Cloud-based is the way to go. Everything is on, in the cloud. And it's for a reason. It's the redundancy um, aspect of it. Uh, God forbid, if anything happens to your equipment, you don't have to worry because it's in the cloud. Um, going hand-to-hand -hand with cloud is also cross-platform. So for me, I work from a MacBook Pro uh, a Mac, um, I'm excuse me, an iPad Pro and a iPhone. So I need to be able to uh, both create as well as expound on my concepts at, at, at a drop of a hat. So cross-platform is very important. And I, and I think you should also, um, you know, if you're not doing that, you should also consider that as well. You need to really utilize cross-platform tools. And then also, um, lastly, collaborative. So if you're producing content in the vacuum, this may not be as relevant, um, but if you're looking to expound or, or to uh, scale your content, um, or if you're already working with the team, you already know collaborative is definitely the way to go when it comes to um, documenting anything. So once again, just as a quick recap, when recording your concepts, um, consider a cloud-based solution, a cross-platform solution, and a collaborative solution. And we're going to actually go into some solutions and workflows now. So you can do, uh, and you'll, if you don't know already, you'll definitely know by the end of this presentation, I am a big Google Doc advocate. I use, I live by Google Docs. And as you can see in this screenshot, uh, the very, this very pr uh, presentation um, all started out as a Google Doc and, and still is, so to speak. And um, so you can, to the point of the one Google 
doc approach. Um, you could basically put all your concepts into one document. And when I say one, I don't mean just one. It can be just one master um, document, or it could be one per content type or category. But the key thing is if you do utilize a one doc approach, that you use the um, heading tags, uh, H2, H3 heading tags, and what that does is basically, on if you if you can see in the left column um, of the, the screenshot, the left side, it creates a table of contents. So now you get a bird's eye view of the different types of concepts that you have in this document. You can easily click on that concept and then scroll or jump right to that content um, concept. And then also, you know, if you want to link between documents as well, it helps as, with that as well. So. This is just one approach you can take. Uh, it's very simple, um, structured is basically the, the point I'm trying to make if you do use this approach. Now, obviously you don't have to do one document. You can use several documents, one per category, one per, or even just as you have a concept, put it into one document and then build on it later on. That's fine as well. The only thing I suggest is that you use a very prudent um, and rigid folder structure and you use some type of a unique name or ID. So when you need to get back to that concept, it's not difficult because if you have multiple documents with similar names, then you have to, uh, you know, scroll, scroll, scroll. If, uh, which one was that again? So like I said, either, you know, do the single and use the, um, as I discussed in the previous slide, the, um, the heading approach, or in this case, if you do use multiple documents, definitely use some type of unique identifier. Now, Coming out of the realm of Google Docs, we can also obviously use device note applications. Um, the good thing about device specific applications is it's fast. Uh, it's mobile optimized and it works really well with dictating your concepts. So if you're an Apple person, you can use Apple Notes. If you're a Samsung person, you can use Samsung Notes. Uh, and if you're a Pixel person, you can use Google Keep. <laughs> um, and of course, there's, there are third-party tools, third-party um, note-taking apps that you can use, Evernote and things of that nature. Um, but like I said, these three are, are um, basically ingrained in the respective device operating system, and it's going to be super fast. And sometimes that's the key. You want to, you do want to document your ideas, but sometimes you need to work at the speed of thought in, in, to some cases to make sure you get it out. And then the last approach, um, somewhat rudimentary, but um, is definitely still effective. Um, and that is to basically just use a email filter. Um, you could set this up in Gmail um, very uh, easily. Uh, the only thing I, I highly recommend though, if you do use this approach, is that once again, use a unique identifier so that um, the filter doesn't pick up other emails that come in with a similar um, word. If you use something unique, you won't have to worry about it. So in, the, in this case, is, or this example, you can use hashtag B concept for blog concept. I highly doubt you're going to get any emails from anyone <laughs> with a subject uh, entitled hashtag B concept. You can make it even more unique. Maybe add some some um, some type of number string or your your uh, phone number, your birth date, whatever it is at the end to really make it super super unique. But like I said, either way, um, the key is to get the concept out of your head and into some type of a tool. Now with this, keep in mind, if you do use, if you do use the email uh, methodology, you are gonna have to do some type of other post uh, processing because you're not gonna write from your from Gmail. Um, so that's something to, to consider as well. So you've got these concepts, you're documenting them, but what do you include, okay? So for me, my approach is I always wanna um, have the topic. Uh, in many cases, I'll do the topic is I'll actually write out the title for the article concept I have. And in fact, sometimes I'll write multiple titles um, as I'm in the, the zone. So you'll hear me say that a lot, like in the zone or in the, the mood or, or in the groove. Um, because the thing is you have to keep in mind when it comes to concepts, it's kind of a, it's, it's a, a visceral type of thing. Like when it comes to you, it's, it's live. You can feel it, especially if it's a really good idea or concept, you could really feel it in your bones. But once you pass that moment, it gets, it, it gets cooled off and you, you're, it's not going to resonate with you the same. So you really want to document as much information as possible while you're in that zone. So hence the reason why I'm kind of like showing you guys what I include when I document my concepts. So to the point, topic, multiple to, um, uh, subjects at times, the bullet points are key points, benefits. Um, sometimes I'll even bullet point layouts and functionality that I see 
um, that would be ideal for that concept. And of course, you can include reference links, especially if you're looking at a respective article or blog post, you can include that uh, to go back to. And then who knows, it may be a piece of media that caught your attention that, that resonated an idea with you, include that. Or if you already have a topic that you, you, you thought of, you can then kind of like do a quick reference to some media because sometimes images are necessary. They, they, the images kind of like bring out more creativity in, in a person. At least it does that for me, maybe you too. Um, and we'll talk more about images in a moment. So where did this whole thing come, you know, come from this whole got to write things down, got to document this? Well, this was years ago back in undergrad. Uh, I heard this quote from Sir Francis Bacon, reading maketh a full man, conference a ready man, writing a, an exact man. So once again, reading makes you knowledgeable. This is like the layman term, <laughs> the layman version. Uh, speaking makes you ready and writing makes you exact. And um, once I heard the quote the first time, it, it so resonated with me that obviously to this day, I'm not gonna say how many years ago, cause that, that will basically tell you my age, but it was, it was more than a decade, <laughs> uh, even decades ago, so to speak. Um, but like I said, I, I really do respect the ideas that come to me and I think you should as well. And documenting your ideas is one of the best ways to respect your concepts. So let's just do a quick um, pro tip or recap. Uh, when you have these concepts that come to you uh, and they're in some type of a system, they're not in your face. So what you need to do is basically schedule um, of some type of a frequency for you to review these concepts, okay? Um, so that you can have them in your face. And then also, once again, we're producing content not for ourselves, we're producing it for our audience. So why not on occasion request your audience to tell you what they want? Very simple. You could do it by way of social media, uh, a blog post, whatever it is, or or even talk directly to specific um, individuals that you know are you know giving you good ideas. Ask them in a formal way. Hey, you know, have you more concepts? Let us know. Send us an email, and then you know you can always reward them if you want. And then lastly, automate this thing. You know, set it and forget it. Put a um, create a calendar reminder for you to go in and to look at your concepts that you've already documented and to request concepts from your audience. Make it simple, like I said, set it and forget it and automate this bad boy. So the next topic we're gonna to discuss uh, is define your content. So we've documented the content, now we're gonna define them. And when it comes to defining content, we're going to, you could basically look at it in two different buckets. You've got content types and you have categories. And both um, elements are very, integral in defining what your content delivers in the actual user experience, because it basically provides structure, uh, both that um, you provide and the, the structure that you have to adhere to, to deliver, you know, what you're supposed to deliver to your audience. Now, these, these two concepts, content types, categories, and all that stuff that you, I'm sure everyone knows this already, but this is the point I really want to drive home. Whenever you create a new content type or category, you need to brand it and you need to describe it. And this needs to be habitual, okay? I'm really, I need to stress this. Anything, and this goes, this is bigger than just content types and categories. This is pretty much anything that you're creating that you're gonna do um, definitely on a regular basis because that's what content types and categories are, right? It, it, you're basically defining a series of, of, of specific type of content. So why is this important? This is, this is important because you got, you're gonna use it Right? You're going to display what this, this, this um, content type or this category is. So make it creative, you know, brand it, make it unique, or make it very straightforward that people will never have to hesitate and say, what is that? Either way, it's up to you. But the thing is, it, it has to have some type of a name. But then you need to describe it. And when you describe it, and this is where I think people get tripped up. They'll make, oh, I'm going to do, you know, such and such blog series. But okay, but what does that mean? How, you know, wh how do you describe that? Um, it's, it's okay. It happens to the best of us. I'm saying make it a, a habit. Why? Because you need to know, know that description for the meta description, for the category or that content type. And then when it comes to publicize it, same thing. You need to know how to describe what it is you want people to consume. And then lastly, once again, something I'm sure you guys know already, URL structure. But um, the key thing is just making all this habitual um, and making it very intentional. So 
this part is a little bit, I guess, more fun uh, when it comes to defining our content page elements. Okay. And this is something I'm sure some people may be adopting and others may not. Um, but this is how I like to do things. I like to basically, once I have a concept and I define it, I like to think about what it, you know, what what Lego p- pieces can I use to make this thing work, to make this happen, to, to materialize this concept. Or another way of think of it is um, when you have all the different elements for this uh, content type or category, it basically these these elements become the palette in which you can basically create your creation. Okay, and by fall, by by um, sitting back, um, getting a bird's eye view of these different page elements, and we're going to actually in a second talk about some page elements. I'll, I'll give you some examples, but what it does is allow you to think bigger and and deliver a better product. Because when you're in the trenches, when you're when you're in just creating the content itself and not thinking about what t- can what tools can I use to to make this better, you can you can get stuck in there. So like I said, sometimes you wanna like, when you're first creating a, a content type or, or category, you know, be creative and, and really think about what type of Lego pieces, what type of variables, what type of elements can I use to really bring this content type or category to life? And another cool thing about doing this in advance, it also allows you to design it in advance, code it in advance and purchase it. So once again, it's kind of like, you can kind of have it all set up, ready to go, toys on the shelf for you to pull out whenever you need it. Okay. And then another thing is when you have these different elements, you can then create different formulas. Almost every content that we consume basically adheres to some type of formula, whether we know it or not. Right. And sometimes when we do know it, it gets, <laughs> it kind of takes away the, the, the movie magic or the, the show mystique when, you know, you do know the formula, but the reality is there is a formula. Formula may change from episode or series to series, but there's always a formula. And this is just one quick example, title to, and you know, subtitle, media, stating a problem, having some type of a social embed to, to, to um, add some type of credibility, giving a solution, and then offering some type of call to action for that, your audience to, to take some type of action that you want them to take. So this is just one example of a content formula you can have, there's, a, you know, I don't say millions of, but there, there are various you know, formulas that you can use. This is just one example. I'm just trying to make you think about, do you have one? Should you have one? And you know, if you, if you wanna do it, do it now, right? And if you need help, I'll, I'll provide my Twitter handle later. Twitter's the best way to contact me. And you know, I'll definitely help however I can. So here are the actual page element examples I discussed. So um, just you know, not saying this is the holy grail. These are just some examples, right? Table of contents, right? Hey, sounds good. It makes your, your page more usable. Social embeds, credibility, functionality, gallery, slideshow, content tabs, before and after sliders, reading bar progress, uh, code embeds, animated GIFs, quotes, tool tips, modal pop-ups, interactive video, and was that helpful, yes or no, uh, mini polls. Um, there are tons of other uh, page elements that you can use on your page, on your website, your blog posts. Here are just some examples. The key thing that I'm trying to really get across is just lay them out. Think about what they are, find plugins, build whatever you need to build, lay them out, and then just have them at your disposal. And like I said, then create your formula for what you want it to be. And then you know also have them as variables to change things up a little bit. You don't want things to be too mundane. Uh, the key thing is, you know, uh, as a friend of mine told me years ago, you want to do the heavy lifting up front, right? And this is just one way of doing some of that heavy lifting. So the next topic or, or, or principle is media matters. So we're going to um, kind of like go into two different realms, one for images, one for videos. First, we'll start off with images. So um, once again, this is just a personal philosophy of mine. Uh, I'm not saying it's, it's the best. But for me, I try my, my best to basically put as little to no text on my images as possible. Now, there are exceptions, right? Um, social share images, for example. You may want to use text to um, drive more traffic. And, and that can be the case. It can really work. But as for on an article itself, I stay away from putting any text on an a image, an uh, intro image, a full article image. I want my images to be images. I want people to get emotional, uh, you know, have some type of emotional connection with the image. No logic, 
let the title be the logic, let the body of the, the, the content and the intro be the logic, but let the Im uh, image truly be an image. And then also when you don't uh, um, adhere to that philosophy, it can lead to problems. And I'll actually show one example and actually two use cases that one good, one bad, so to speak, uh, later slide. But the other thing for me that, and actually I've, I've, I came to this conclusion years ago and I haven't heard of anyone else who does this and not saying that they don't, but like in music, and it's so funny because Steve and I, prior to this presentation, we're talking about music. You have the theory or the, or the technique of crescendo, right? Getting louder, um, more intensity. Um, what I want is the user experience to crescendo at the article. Now, if you're using the same image and same title and same intro every single place, right? From home page to category page to detail page, there's no crescendo. It's like the same content, right? Above the fold. So think about that. Like what type of user experience are you giving your, your actual audience? Is it crescendoing? Is there some type of a, oh, so to speak, when they get to your article? So that's how I personally try to do things. And um, I can't remember the, the gentleman's name. He's, uh, he was producing um, Joomla Templates at the time. This was years ago. He was basically on his category pages. There were no images, just the title and the intro. And then when you, get, when you arrive to the detail page, it then had the image. And I'm like, why is he doing that? Why? And then, like I said, I, I'm not sure if that was intentional, but that's what I got from it. I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. Like it's, it, for one, it's loading super fast, right? That was, that's one thing. But the, the key thing is there was something, there was some type of benefit at the end of the road, at the article. So just something to consider, not saying it's the gospel, but just something to consider. But now one thing that you need to do for sure is create and include social share images. I can't tell you uh, the countless number of times I've seen um, websites, even credible websites, that do not have an open, open graph image, um, or they don't have the open graph image that's optimized. Uh, they're just using the same full article image, which is a completely different dimension or may have thing, elements in it that's not ideal for a social share. And keep in mind, when you create this and, and, and actually um, include a social share image, it's not just on Facebook that these individuals, these, the, your, um, the audience will see. We're talking about Twitter also utilizes it. Um, LinkedIn, and then more importantly, if um, depending on your OS, if you're using like a Mac or a, um, I think some versions of, of Android, you also see the, the open graph image. So it's, it's not just for Facebook anymore. So like I said, please, please, please create and include a social share image. And you wanna probably create a template 1200, by 6.30 and um, it should be a part of your workflow. It also in regards to images, and this is actually something that I learned from Image Recycle, and that is you need to have both a compressed version and a full version, okay? So we, we are, we're all about optimization. We hear that all the time, but there are use cases when you do not want to have an image that's optimized or compressed, okay? So you have a compressed version for the website that you upload to ensure that the visitors can view the site in the most expedient way, yes. But when you're uploading that image to a social media platform, right? So we're talking about basically any third party website that you wanna utilize or upload this, your image to, guess what? They're, they're gonna be compressing it. They are going to compress it. So like, I, like to the point I, I said earlier with image recycle, I had asked them, this was years ago, you know, how do I get the best you know, image quality? Da, 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 da. And they told me, upload full resolution and let our algorithm do its thing. And I'm like, whoa, that makes sense. So you may want to <laughs> uh, adhere to that. It, it, you know, it definitely creates another step. Um, that's why I have these two folders because what you should really do is have a folder for compression and, and a folder for a full version so you don't get them mixed up. It, it's a little bit more work, but I think it's, it's well worth it. And here's just a couple examples um, to, to the points I had made earlier. Uh, in this case, you have the, um, the redundancy of the person's name, both in the title. And, and I apologize for picking on the Joomla magazine. It's, it's, it's no offense. Uh, I actually had some examples, but I didn't want to actually, <laughs> you know, use examples of people that I know. And, you know, I, I figure if anyone's going to take it on the chin, it would be the Joomla magazine. But there's, you know, no harm or foul. It's just an example. But to the point, uh, you have the title, you have uh, meet a Joomla, Russell Winter, but then you have it again in the image. It's redundant. And then more so than anything, 
I want to see this person. I want to see who they are, what makes them unique. And as you can see in the, the, the larger red box, the majority of the, of the actual visual is like branding, is, is, is style, you know, some type of style, style of shapes and such. And that kind of takes away from who the person is because, you know, you're going to see the same style used over and over. And once again, you get, gets a little redundant. Whereas I'll never see this, this gentleman's face again. Why not give it to me full width, full size, you know, and it's full splendor. And here's another example, same article. Another reason why you should limit your uses of text on images is because on a mobile device, depending on the size of the text and the weight of the text, you it, it can really get lost in the sauce. So once again, it makes you think why even include it. An image, like I said, will always be an image <laughs> and let it, let it be an image. Another thing to consider too is when you have images, once again, I said limit the amount of text on images. There are some use cases where you just can't do that, okay? So Netflix, movie streaming, uh, every movie poster has text on it. Well, how else will we know what it is? So this is a great example of how you can basically, I don't say trick the viewer, but you know, downplay the text, so to speak. See how they skewed the, um, the, the images. They have the overlay, the gradient. So basically the background text is, is really truly background and the foreground text is easily viewable and recognizable. So really cool uh, example of when you have to, you know, there's no you know, way around having text on images. Here's a, a cool way of kind of getting around it. Okay, another thing to consider when it comes to um, images is that images do really help when it comes to SEO. So um, on-page SEO or even image SEO, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, and I would definitely highly suggest do not hesitate to, you know, or don't underestimate, I should say, the file names and the captions. Those do have a lot of power. In fact, I was just watching a, um, a Moz video with Rand Fish um, just a few days ago, and he talked about that. So please, please, um, f you know, name your files accordingly with the keywords and also include captions. I know that's something that people kind of, you know, put off, so to speak, but captions do have a lot of, um, provide a lot of, it provides a lot of context to a search engine. I'm not going to talk about, you know, alt images because I know everyone knows that already, especially for accessibility. So I didn't even include that. Um, something else to think about um, in regards to image SEO, uh, there are people or schools of thought that, that, you know, definitely would like to, or, or say there's a benefit for keeping metadata in an image. So, um, most image optimization tools, whether it be, you know, uh, online or, or desktop version or whatever, they strip out that, that, that metadata because they want the file size as small as possible. But like I say, if you do want to retain that, that data, because, you know, you, you intentionally put that, that metadata in the image, uh, I found so far only two, two, two tools that allow you to retain it. One being image recycle, uh, and it's only for the paid version. And then image opt-in, which is unfortunately uh, only for Mac users. Um, but those are two really great tools that, like I said, that will both optimize or compress your image, but still retain the metadata that you want included. And uh, another cool thing that you can do when it comes to uh, image SEO, and uh, I'm gonna actually show you an example in a second, and that is you could basically crop an image. So you can have, like I said, text on images is not a good thing in, in, in some cases. But you could have a bar at the bottom with your brand and you know some type of unique identifier or keywords and such, a message, and you can actually crop this by way of CSS and divs and such, and deposit photos, which is actually a really great um, and cost-effective image uh, stock photo um, company. They actually do it really well, and it's kind of like the first way I, I actually even learned uh, this this uh, this you know hack, so to speak. And I'm gonna, I'll actually show you the example. So here it is. This is the actual, um, and I kind of like, you know, um, grayed out the the, uh, the portion that's not really necessary. You know, it's just a, a page. But as you can see, it's it's the page, the the image, the button, all that other cool stuff, normal stock photo layout uh, and such. But what's really cool is if you actually right click on the image and then view the image, you know, in its full source, this is what you see. So that whole bar at the bottom with the logo and the, the website address and the, and the uh, image ID is, is hidden. It's cropped by the div. So that's a really cool uh, method um, that you can actually use to kind of still get that SEO benefit, but at the same token, you know, not um, obstruct the, the viewing or the, or the presentation 
uh, of your, um, your blog post or article. And then once again, to the point of uh, image recycle, uh, if you have a paid version, uh, you can actually click on the clean metadata and then none, and then uh, it basically will not um, remove any type of metadata that you have in there. And then as for image opt-in, they have the uh, preference where you can strip the uh, metadata for a PNG or the JPEG, just uncheck it because it comes, it, by default it's checked. So just uncheck those two um, parameters and then booyah. Um, you can still get the, you know, the very small compressed images, um, but still keep in, I, I think maybe uh, one kilobyte, if that <laughs> uh, is, is basically what you're, you're, uh, you're, you're, you're uh, adding to the, uh, the image. If you, if you retain, I think maybe even less than one kilobyte. Um, so it's, it's well worth it. And, and who knows where Google will, will um, end up. Uh, Cause right now it's, it's one thing, a year or two, three months, whatever, who knows how, um, you know, uh, Google will basically respect or, or um, um, basically utilize metadata. So it, it doesn't hurt to, to do it if you want to try to have some type of competitive edge now or in the future. And then also pro tip when it comes to images, you want to cache bust. So basically what that means is, uh, or a solution I should say, is basically append some type of a, a, a timestamp suffix to every image. And that way, when you change the image, you're going to change, it's going to have a new timestamp and that way, whenever the viewer views that article or that page, they will always see the latest and the greatest. Okay. And then I'm actually going to show you guys, I'm going to provide a list of, of all these different resources I'm discussing. So it's just like, literally, you can go back and just bookmark, click on the link. But yeah, timestamps are super simple. There's, there's a bunch of different websites. I actually just chose one of them that I thought was pretty cool and simple. You know, one click, you can grab the timestamp and just add it to your, uh, your image. So we talked about images. Let's talk about videos because media still matters. I personally am a fan of Vimeo when it comes to on-site videos. Uh, some people, I shouldn't say some, many people use YouTube. I personally suggest you do not use YouTube for on-page or on-site videos because you basically get a whole bunch of stuff that you didn't sign up for uh, or, or basically uh, elements or UI elements on the YouTube video that's going to take your viewer away from your website. Um, that includes the avatar, uh, that includes the title, you know, and of course the, uh, <laughs> the one thing that people probably hate most is the um, related videos. All those, those elements take people, will, will take your viewer off your site. So once again, I suggest Vimeo. It's a clean interface. You know, you can do the free version. The pay version gives you a little bit more call to actions. You can replace, um, you know, the media without actually, you know, putting up a whole new video. You can same video or same um, upload, just replace the video. There's so many cool little tools that you can do with Vimeo and it's very cost effective. You know, there are other tools out there, but uh, it really depends on your budget. But I, I found that Vimeo is a, is a very reliable, the data centers really crank out some really good bandwidth and it's great. Now, if you're trying to produce content for social purposes, Vimeo is not the tool of choice. Um, in that regard, then you definitely want to use some other type of platform, YouTube, and then of course, posting to the social media platforms um, themselves. And being, be creative, something else to consider. You don't have to do the, the traditional 16 by nine. You could do one by one, nine by 16. If you can leverage captions, it helps with people who are in need of accessibility. And also if someone's viewing it in the office, they're unable to actually uh, listen to it by way of volume. This is a great way to still kind of get the gist uh, or the understanding of the, uh, the content. And then of course, all the little, little things matter. So good music, uh, quality voiceover matters. Uh, I'm going to provide links to those for you. And um, you want to also mind your metrics. Um, so, you know, each platform has its, its metric but you could also use GTM uh, and I provide a link to that um, as well, where you can actually, you know, you can use Vimeo or YouTube, but then uh, view the actual stats in Google analytics uh, and both, you know, the number of clicks and even as, as granular as how far into the video, did they complete it? Did they only watch 25%? It's pretty cool. So like I said, I'll provide a link to that as well. And then the other thing is there's there's many different ways to produce videos. Uh, there's desktop solutions, there are web apps. And uh, once again, I'm gonna provide all these uh, links, but I'm just gonna kind of like kind of go over some of them real quick. So there's one called Headliner, which is really great for like audiograms. So those are like the waveform videos are really, really, really um, important for uh, 
podcast or audio-based programming. ScreenFlow is a really great tool for doing screen recordings because it captures like the mouse movement and such. Unfortunately, it's only for Mac, but it's a really great tool. Uh, there's a new contender called Descript, which I'm hearing really great things about. Basically, it's like an all-in-one solution, uh, really ideal for like podcasters. But basically, you could do screen recording, transcription, video editing, and subtitles all in one platform. And then lastly, um, you know, animations are important. And, um, you know, a lot of animation uh, applications can be very complicated, but guess what? You can use Keynote, you can use PowerPoint. I still use Keynote to this day to make a number of my uh, animations and you would be surprised. Like people would never even know. So uh, don't, don't be afraid to go old school when it comes to uh, producing videos and making animations. And then here are just some screenshots of some of the tools. So this is Soundstripe. As you can see, you can uh, drill down based on like moods and characteristics and genres. And they have thousands and thousands, uh, maybe even millions by now of um, music for, um, you know, video projects as well as, you know, sound effects. And then Fiverr. Fiverr is a really great resource for looking for voiceover actors. So as you can see, British actors, uh, English, Polish, I mean, you, it can really drill down to different dialects and, and language uh, and such based on your needs. So Fiverr is a really great tool. And then this is just a quick screenshot of um, uh, actually the headliner app itself. And um, this is just a, a use case where I basically um, made my own little like green screen effect <laughs> because I, I, even though headliners are a really great tool for creating the audio waves, for creating like other types of videos is not as robust. So basically in this case, what I did was I, I had the audio, uploaded the audio to headliner, produced the waveform, um, made with the green screen background. And then I took that and superimposed it into another video application <laughs> so I could just use the, um, the, the audio waveform. So this, you know, basically there's, there's different ways to skin a cat. This is just one example in this one tool. And then as I talked about before, you can use Google Tag Manager to, um, to basically uh, get analytics from your video. This is just a, a screenshot of, of one of the examples. So something else to consider, as I said before, audio is very important. You do not have to spend a lot of money and you don't have to get super complicated. Uh, a lot of my, my voiceovers that I do, I actually just use my iPhone. Um, you can get a, a, what, a dollar, so to speak, um, mic cover, uh, a muff as they call it, and put it over the base of your phone, which is where your, uh, your mic is, is located. And the other thing to consider is just make sure that depending on the, on the app that you're using, that you change the audio quality to the highest, which in, in this case is lossless for a, an iPhone. And um, basically go into your closet and um, you can record some really, really good voiceovers with your phone as long as you don't you know, have the phone too close to your mouth. And as long as the, they're called plosives aren't picked up and that's where the, uh, the microphone cover comes in. So you know, basically for $1, you can uh, create your own little studio in your uh, closet. And then when it comes for, as to a pro tip for audio, um, pe people forget, often forget about the audio aspect to video, okay? But try watching a movie, <laughs> a horror movie, whatever, suspense movie without the audio. It, it makes such a big difference. And in the case of just a traditional blog um, with an embed, it, you do not want a user to have an experience where they, they hit play and then they're like, oh, I got to turn it up or, oh my gosh, it's so loud. You know, you want to make sure you adhere to, uh, you know, the, this industry standard and volume and you want things to be nice and level and clear. So I'm going to also provide a tool for mastering your audio um, in the link as well. So text matters. We're almost, almost home. In regards to the key elements uh, or text elements to uh, a, a, post, a blog post or an article, these are things that you guys know already. Uh, the title, the intro, the meta uh, title, meta description, target keywords, the alias or the slug. All I'm saying is create some type of template. You already know what you need. It's in Joomla itself. It's in whatever content management system you're using. Just create a template. What I'm, the key thing I'm trying to say is please do not write in the CMS. I've <laughs> That is a bad thing. You really want to write in some type of a, a document or note-taking application. Have some type of, as I call it, a manifest, which basically has all the information structured so you cannot forget anything, but then also could have other little tidbits, right? And different, you could have different versions of, of whatever it is. You can go back to it 
and it's all there in the manifest, just like a manifest, you know, when you're traveling or, or, or shipping something, it knows every destination. You want to basically have every point of destination, every point of, of information that you need for that piece of content. Really super simple to create. And like I said, set it and forget it. And um, please do it. Another thing to consider when you're um, dealing with, with um, text, and this is something that I'm a big proponent on. Uh, in fact, I was just talking to Steve about this the other day please you leverage your ID um, heading tags. Something that people often forget, but it adds so much functionality to a page. Uh, it basically allows you to, to link to a section, right? You have an article, it can have five different elements to it, five different sections, it could be a long article. I need to get a, a person to this respective portion of the article. You know, I, I can't just tell them, oh yeah, scroll down halfway. I want, I want them to go directly to it. And that's where the ID um, tags come into play, right? You can use it for a table of contents. You can use it to link from page to page, from an email to from a social post directly to where you want to go, okay? So all you need to do to, to, to basically implement this is just add the ID tag. Just make sure that whatever it is, it's, you know, it, you can use a Slugify um, type of tool. It needs to be, um, you can, you know, basically you can use the full title itself, uh, and slugify it, or you can use some type of abbreviation. The only thing that you need to do, because um, you can use either one, just make sure it's unique, you know, because when it comes to HTML and ID tags, you can only have one ID tag per page or per post. And then also something to think about too is the link visibility. The links can be hidden, right? So that, you know, you know what they are and you can then link to them or you can make them visible, kind of like um, how GitHub pages work. It's up to you. So just so you know that there is nothing that I've found so far to date in the Joomla extension repository that offers this. So, you know, this could be a plugin opportunity. This is kind of like one of my J wishlist um, items for years now. <laughs> so who knows, maybe someone could do it. And this is just an example of, you know, Steve implementing it on um, the page for this conference. So, you know, boom, you can then jump right to my good friend Victor's speech or, or portion of the page right there. So last thing when it comes to text matters, you definitely want to collaborate as much as possible. There's so many benefits to collaborating with others. Basically offers a fresh perspective. You can leverage other people's strengths. Just make sure you have the individual kind of ease in. You don't want to just throw them to the wolves. And when you do have them ease in, you want to provide them with different tools. So style guides, samples, both on your, on your um, website or others. Uh, and then some type of templates. You, you wanna give them you know, a roadmap to success if they're gonna be working with you. And then um, lastly, you can also leverage mentions. Mentioning people in your articles or your blog posts are great. It's a great opportunity to leverage other people's credibility. Uh, you could also get some backlinks possible, possibly. Um, you can also get some social media mentions. Um, it's a great way to get both potentially. And then methods, you can you know, obviously just put the person's name or their product or their brand with a link. You could use a quote or you could use a social embed. So pro tip, and this is something that I unfortunately got burnt on years ago. Uh, I was using someone to produce some content and luckily a per another person I was working with was Googling something and found out that every piece of content that they sent me was plagiarized. So I uh, quickly, you know, Google searched and found some type of a tool and I came across Copyscape and it's been my best friend ever since. So if you use any type of third party or a vendor or such for writing content, you should definitely use some type of plagiarism check tool to cover your, you know, backside, so to speak. And if you want to be really snazzy um, as a content creator, you could always write your content and then use Copyscape. And then to kind of, you know, make a PDF or a screenshot and provide it with the content that you're, you know, delivering to the person and say, hey, I've already done my due diligence. As you can see, this is original content. So time to wrap things up. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, basically all this is basically information to prepare you. And uh, I'm, uh, if, if you know me personally, you'll know that I'm into cartoons. And uh, I was watching uh, Young Justice, one of my favorite cartoons, and the villain Vandal Savage said this, fortune favors the prepared. Um, but really, it's, it's a Louis Pasteur uh, quote. And uh, it's something that I, I try, I, I hold dear to my heart. So. so that pretty much almost sums it up. As I promised before, I do have some tools uh, that I'll provide from my utility belt. Some of the things that the, the tools will offer is, you know, the timestamp, the audiogram, Slugify. I threw in some other goodies in there as well. Tweet to PNG, 
a Vimeo and YouTube thumbnail downloader, ways to remove background from your images, ways to you know, increase your images by double um, if you have like a small image. Uh, so you can either use the QR code if you're on your you know, desktop. I've also pinned it to, to my Twitter. And if you do a search for the hashtag uh, Joomla Shack Conference 2020, you'll also get to the, um, the my Twitter post that features the uh, Google Doc that you can then have all my, or I shouldn't say all my, some of my goodies, uh, at least all the ones that I've outlined in this presentation. So lastly, you know, especially for someone like myself who doesn't code, we always, always have to give thanks. You know, we're using tools that other people are creating. So please donate, um, if, especially if it's a free tool, report bugs, and share it with others. And that's pretty much it. My name is Joe Campbell. You can reach me at Hey Joe Campbell pretty much on any social platform. And um, I'm here to help. Hey, awesome. Thank you so much, Joe. I have a, um, a, a question for you. How do you manage to find all these tools? Do you have a like a go-to resource that allows you to um, is it a blog or like a deal site or no? So um, I, I am a, I am a big user of um, AppSumo. I, I love um, I, I see it as a way of investing in startups, uh, and that's and very important to me. So I, I do find some tools by way of AppSumo. You know, just going across various websites and, and doing certain things. I'm a big bookmarker, so that's pretty much what it is. Like I'll find a tool, I'll come across something, and I immediately bookmark it. I don't wait. You know, I don't wait. I, I literally bookmark in the moment. And this is just, you know, this is just a small portion of, the, of my uh, tool set that I use. And it's just something, you know, you just cultivate over the years. And then a lot of times one thing leads to another, you know, like I'm doing one thing. And I'm just like, wait a minute, they got, it has to be a tool that, that allows me to, you know, such and such and such. I'll Google it. And I'm like, wow, there is. And what's really funny is there's been several times I'm like, can I do such and such? Is there a tool? And there hasn't been. So I actually have documents um, of various tools and plugin concepts that, you know, I, I'm just kind of like sitting on and one day, hopefully I can, you know, be in the right uh, mind and in the, in the right company. Cause you know, once again, I'm not a coder uh, and I can work with some, you know, another person or a team that can bring some of these concepts to life. So we are recording this in mid December, 2020. Mm -hmm. If I had to put you on the spot and say, what is your one favorite tool that you've discovered and really relied on this year? What would it be? What's Joe Campbell's number one pick of 2020? I mean, um, you, you you said you're a huge Google Docs fan. Yeah, but is, I've been using that for years. <laughs> is there something else that really, you really relied on this year? Well, this is not so much content development, but more so productivity. Uh, and that is Alfred. If, um, if you're a, a Mac user, um, Alfred basically replaces Spotlight. Uh -huh, and, okay. Yeah, and with that, you can do so, so much. So, so I hit command um, spacebar, and as you can see, that appears. And with this, I can do so many things. I can um, basically, um, you know, from here, I can pull up your contact. I won't pull it up because I want people to see your personal information. <laughs> you can do, uh, you can find documents. So uh, I can do PNG. And from here, I can just put logo and, you know, I can find documents really fast. There's uh, various, like, um, I'm really into, like, not typing, right? So, so whether it's copy and pasting or having different triggers, um, that's a very big thing for me as well. So I do a lot of abbreviations and then it will finish for me. So I, don't, I never write my email address. I never write my home address, my, my business mailing address. All those are, like, you know, a few keywords and then it completes it for me. So Alfred is a little app you can download to your Mac and allows you to search through your site or search through your desktop. It, it looks like it's free. And then maybe 30 bucks, one. you can yeah, get some add-ons. Correct, correct. And then here's the actual Mia. Awesome. And I'll extend the same question to the people in the chat while people, uh, while people pull that up. Do, do the attendees have any recommendations for their, their favorite find of 2020? Any responses? Uh, not yet, but I'm going to mention mine. I'm going to say mine is um, mine is a little funny, um, but incredibly useful. There's a little Mac app called In Your Face. Hmm. And what it does is every time you have a meeting coming up on your calendar, it basically takes over your desktop, 
and says, hey, 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 ah. don't forget you have a meeting in 10 minutes. Gotcha, and that has gotcha. saved my backside so many times this year. I like that. I like that. Another tool that I use, let me see if I can drag it over to the, because I have three screens, which is actually, the, I think the two, oh my gosh, these both kind of, kind of go hand in hand and uh, it's Keyboard Maestro. And literally like Keyboard Maestro opens up so much functionality on a Mac that's just sitting there waiting for, for the right, you know, for the picking. And basically you can apply these different workflows or triggers to specific applications. Um, so here's just a, you know, some examples. So for example, in I use, I'm a Brave user versus Chrome, but um, I can delete instead of like clicking and deleting an email, I can sit command delete, delete my email. Saves me so much time opening up um, the, you know, view source, uh, little things like that. Um, my music, um, I can actually, I've created a trigger so that I can move forward and backwards um, just with, you know, hitting two hotkeys for my Apple music. So once again, like it's just, it just makes life a lot easier. And then one of my favorite things about this is it also controls windows. So workspace prime. So with this, I hit these three, you know, um, hotkeys and it basically opens up Alfred, puts it on the screen and the, the, the proportions that I want it. It opens up literally everything. It creates my whole workspace for me by just hitting three keys. So I'll do it right now. Boom, boom, boom. Boom. So you can't see, but I have three different screens, but everything is laid out how it is supposed to be. Brave is in the foreground. Power um, Photoshop is in, in, in the background. It's literally like, boom, just like that. Hit, hit, hit my hotkeys and I'm done. So yeah, that that's those two apps are, um, it, those, are those are like apps that I, I I, can't, I cannot, they're indispensable. I couldn't imagine um, working without them, but because I use them so much, I kind of forget <laughs> how valuable they are. Um, but yeah, this, this, and there's some other stuff too. Uh, I was using raindrop.io for a minute. I'm not sure if you guys heard of that, but that's a, uh, a cross-platform um, bookmarking tool because the thing is I use Brave on my desktop, but then I use Safari on my, um, my iPad and my iPhone. So, you know, uh -huh. my bookmarks are very important, you know, and um, like I said, the um, raindrop.io was basically like a, you know, a, a go between, but um, I'm just now waiting for Brave to uh, basically offer um, a cloud solution for hosting my bookmarks so that I don't have to, you know, worry about that anymore. But like I said, there's, there's tons of different little goodies out there. Just got to find them. Awesome. Well, Joe, as always, it's been an absolute pleasure to hear from you. Thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure.